All right, here we go. The fourth part of the historical investigation, the analysis component. You might think of it as a stew. I'm going to go through the examples here. I'm going to go over the introductory slide with a brief overview of what it's all about. Then I'm going to go into a high sample. Then I'm going to go into a low sample. So, the analysis. What you can think of for the analysis is, first off, cite heavily and correctly. A lot of students don't really do well on the analysis because they don't understand the extent to which citations have to be used. If I had to put a number to it, I would say that students should be expected to produce maybe even up to 15 citations in the section. Definitely if a student is looking to attain a 5 or a 6, they should have more than 10 citations. In the sample that I show you today, there's almost 17. So even though it's you know maybe 600 to 800 words, there's a lot of words which belong to other historians. Next, use key pieces of evidence from section B, the summary of evidence. So what that means is that the evidence that you should be engaging, the evidence that you should be talking about, is evidence that was already mentioned in section B. But what's happening in section D is that Arguments are going to be postulated or put forward by yourself, the author, and you will contrast and compare the opinions of different historians in order to get at the answer, really, in order to lead up to the conclusion, which will be the next section. So you'll need to use the evidence from section B. You can use some other evidence, but you should keep it very, very minimal, if any, because if you start to use too much new evidence in section D, that will actually count against you. The last part. Unpack the sources from section C and connect others together. So what that means is that you should, when you're trying to look for the differences or similarities or a historical consensus, you should mention the opinions of the historians or the opinions of the authors, the origins of the documents that you analyze in section C, the evaluation of sources. So this is basically what we're looking for in the analysis if I had to make it briefer, I would say lots of citations and lots of looking for similarities or differences among the historians or the sources that are being used. I kind of give the example that sometimes this is like a stew and the writer, the author, is crafting with their own unique recipe a stew. Of course, in your stew you're going to have carrots, potatoes, celery, delicious beef, probably seasoned. And when you serve it up to all the visitors, they're going to be eating the stew. And they're going to love it. They're going to love the stew. They're going to have smiles on their faces because it's so delicious. And what makes a delicious stew? Lots of ingredients. No one wants to eat a stew that's just potatoes. That's not a stew. That's something else. That, you know what that is? That's potato soup. All right? And we're not making potato soup. We're making a stew. And in order to make a stew, you need all of those ingredients. And in order to make a good analysis, you need all of those different citations by all of those different authors. Don't serve potato soup, serve stew. Okay. So, high example first. This is a piece that I've shown before, I've used it in a few different parts. The question is, with what justification can it be claimed that it was the leadership of Trotsky which promoted red victory in the Russian Civil War? So. We go down to our fourth section, the analysis section. We can see that there are many, many, many citations. Now, I'm not going to read through it, but we've got lots of author names being mentioned as the explanation is going. Here we've got the opinion of one of the authors, Bonch. Here's the opinion of another author, Lynch. And basically, you know, it kind of proceeds in this, this format where many different historians are being mentioned and the citations are coming out rapidly. And there's kind of being synthesized together, woven together almost like a fabric of many different colors to create a masterpiece. Like if you go to Guatemala, you buy some of those indigenous linens. It's just like that. So we can see one, two, three, four, five, six citations in the first paragraph. And they keep going. Seven, at seven in the first paragraph, sorry, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, there's tons of them, lots of them. By the end we're at 17 and there's 700 total words. 
So what makes the analysis unique is how the argument is put together, which historians are consulted, how you synthesize the opinions of those historians to decide which argument of which historian makes the most sense. Or if it's a question where there's a majority of primary sources and you're taking the role of the historian, just looking at the primary sources, not looking at the works of other historians, then it is you looking at the primary sources, deciding which ones have more merit than others. So this is the great work. This is a five out of six. The only reason they don't get a six out of six is because they aren't explicit enough with contrasting the opinions of the different historians. They give lots of facts, they give lots of citations, they give lots of opinions of historians, but they don't make explicit claims about which historians provide stronger arguments. Let's go to the leak sample. We've seen this one before too. The question is, to what extent did the Norwegian and Allied sabotage of the heavy water plant in Rajukin hinder Hitler acquiring the atomic bomb? So, if we go down to the analysis section in this one, there is a problem immediately. The problem here is that there is no citations at all. No. There's no, the first paragraph, nothing. Second paragraph, nothing. Third paragraph, nothing. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. There's no MLA citation. There's no footnotes. There's no referencing of other documents. Automatically, if this is the case, your maximum score can be 2 out of 6. And in this case, the author does get a 2 out of 6. But that's the cost. If there's no evidence, your score is in the basement. It's either going to be a 1 out of 6 or a 2 out of 6. You start citing, get a 3. You know, you have 3, uh, 4, 5, 6 citations, you're looking at 3. You start getting up a little bit more, 7, 8, 9, looking at a, a 4. And then, you know, if you start going above 10 and you're effectively comparing authors, that's when you can start to get a 5 and a 6. So that's really what we're looking for. And the reason why so many students have difficulty with this is because either they don't know how to cite, they don't cite correctly, they don't cite at all, and the reason that these three problems emerge are because the expectations in previous essays in English class and history class have frequently not required such extensive citations. When someone hears that they have to have 13, 15 citations in just 800 words, they think, how do I even do that? That might be the most citations that anyone has ever written in a whole essay. And now that needs to be produced in just 800 words? The analysis is definitely the hardest part of the historical investigation. But hopefully after this explanation, after overviewing these basic expectations, it makes a lot more sense. I think that's about it.